Just fucking do it. Subscribe now. For about 15 or 18 years, <clears throat> the action plan that we used <clears throat> was about 19 steps. <clears throat> and then we experimented, we experimented, and that's too long. <clears throat> I don't know if it's too long because you couldn't keep your attention for 19 steps. I'm not sure the reason why. So we've abbreviated it over the years and down to four steps, which we're going to talk about in, in a little bit. But um, like I have a, 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 a hyper attention deficit disorder, so I, I know what that feels like, okay? But not everybody's got attention deficit disorder, and I have hyper. Um, but I was able to get through 19 steps, but for whatever reason, uh, the, the kids, you didn't. So um, the, um, but it, it gets down to how much, pay price to action, how much are you willing to sacrifice? And normally the sacrifice is in terms of time, time and people that you uh, have to cut out of your life. You don't have to, well, let me back up. You don't have to do a goddamn thing. You don't have to cut one fucking person out of your life. You can see they roll around in a slop uh, like the hogs in a pan forever, and I don't really give a shit. But if, if, if you want to have a, a, a meaningful um, result, outcome, then you got to cut people out of your life. So, and, um, and, and I would be, again, disingenuous if I told you that a lot of people try it. And when we talk about the personal foundation, and, and Peter said, you're going to skip the first four steps, that's, that's what it is because you have to sort your, your own shit out. You have to get your own head screwed on straight. And some people either intuitively, inherently, realize that that's the most difficult part, so they just skip it and they go to trying to find a chairman. And uh, the results, it would be nice if I could see the results are mixed, but they're not mixed. They're almost all totally bad. They're almost all totally bad. Because when you don't sort your own life out, you pick the wrong chairman. You pick a lesser than industry expert. You pick, you try to be CEO and you're not. So it has a cascading effect of which almost all is negative. Now, once in a while, once a year, somebody will go through it and um, by serendipity, Allah, or whoever the hell, um, they get through it. But it ultimately it comes back to bite you because then, though you seemingly got a good board, after three deals, the chairman throws you out. Or something, and you've heard enough horror stories now. You, you, we're only uh, um, uh, scraping the very tip of the iceberg in horror stories. Horror stories. Um, the, um, last night you saw uh, my uh, virtual mentor, uh, and I've said this many times now, 50 miles down the road, it's hard to find something without his name on it in Dunfermline. Um, depending on what story you want to believe, he either left Scotland when he was seven or 12. I like the story, the movie you saw doesn't say this, when he was seven, stowed away in the belly of a boat, uh, sleeping with rats for nine weeks. I like that story. But the new modernized story is he left with his dad when he was 11 or 12, after his dad went boost after they borrowed all the money um, they could from their relatives. Um, the, um, but with all his goodness and grace, that the money that he gave away, and the literally hundreds, thousands of libraries that he's founded, and universities that he's founded, he's never gotten an award from the king or queen of England. Not an honorable mention. Not a go kiss my ass, blow me, never. And there's good reason why he hasn't. Um, the, um, I'm not going to ask you, as I did, made the mistake with that young Dutch girl, how many of Andrew's traits do you have? But comments about Mr. Carnegie. And we are here because of him. And I, I would... Uh,
highly recommend when you get some shekels, that's Jewish money, uh, that you go to Skibo Castle. It's uh, an experience. Anything about Mr. Carnegie? Yes, sir. A lot like you have the ability to uh, you know, predict these black swan events. He saw World War I coming and pushed a lot for world peace right before and then died, you know, but like he saw it happening. Well, back in those days, it was uh, pretty easy to see it happen if you read the paper. But the other side of it is they didn't have instant communication then. Something that happened in Germany took, other than the teletype, but I mean to read it, you know, took a long, you know, in, uh, in Bumfuck, Alabama, you may never have read it. It was a great movie, uh, Sergeant York, about the World War I in Alvin York. He's in the, uh, he's in the hollers of Kentucky, and uh, they find out about the war, uh, you know, weeks, if not months, after, after the event. It's, it's, um, but now, I mean, you guys get a feed on your phone, and you know, instantly. And uh, again, I don't know why you guys have cell phones. I don't know why you guys get your emails. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard, the why you get your emails on cell phones. Um, and it's all marketing. I mean, if uh, it's like when they come out with new cars every year. I used to be on the, uh, have a guy, a big senior guy from Chrysler years ago on one of my boards, and he said that uh, you don't need it. And this is before. This is when they first came out with a 100,000-mile 100, guarantee, you know, that uh, with the first 100,000 miles, they fixed all the shit. It was a long time ago. And now I don't, I don't even know what they are. But he said, Dan, we don't, we don't need cars every year. We don't need new cars every two years. We don't need new cars every three years. Arguably, four or five years, it starts to break the shit. Now, he says, but we make the cars so they'll break the shit after four or five years. We can make cars that would last 10 years. And now the cars don't break the shit even, for, even in four or five years. But through marketing, etc., they convince you because they change the headlights or whatever, that you should get a new car. And so the, um, but Andrew is, um, was, a, was a gifted guy. Certainly ahead of his time. Yes, sir, in the back. One thing I noticed from the movie is that he was so, is your, in, your, in your words, he had such balls. He made big decisions in conventional but wisdom. Just like you boys. I mean, I felt the kindred spirit because I watched it last night uh, uh, over in the castle. God damn, doesn't that remind me of him and him and him? And I'm, I, I was overwhelmed. Yeah. He was, uh, he was, he, he reinvested all his money instead of paying out dividends to his partners and, and, and uh, invested in more Coke, the, the Coke for the steel. Uh, they just thought. Not Chicago Coke. We understand. Yeah. What okay. you mean? <laughs> uh, just making those, making those decisions, uh, just doing. Big things when people tell him he wasn't smart to do it, Correct. and he just didn't give a fuck. He just kept on rolling, and he he foreseen what the the next was coming to industrial America, buildings, yeah. bridges. He just kind of like just knew it, and he just he he took but his he, own time. He, he got in the circle of smart people. Uh, how much information he stole from the teletype, no one will ever know. But he had the source, the pipe right there. So, and he was able to get the information, and he had uh, the tenacity, grit, balls, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, t to move forward and take action. All these guys pull the trigger. Uh, some of the guys uh, pull the trigger. Don't confuse me with the facts, and you've heard all that. You know, I may be wrong, but I'm never in doubt. Um, because they believe in themselves. And how can you believe in yourself? Only when you've got self-esteem. Only when you've got self-confidence. Only when you've got uh, uh, self-awareness and all those cliche things. But you don't do it if you don't have that. And, you know, 99% of the people that come to the seminar from the, the first day in uh, May of 1993 at the Sheraton Hotel, they, they, they don't because they don't, again, 
their parents, they see that their parents don't have it. And it gets back to the uh, preacher man's son. I guess God, God doesn't pay too well. And when you think about that, if you think that through, and I'm, this seminar is not about thinking that kind of thing through, but if you do think it through just a little, he's right. The, uh, the people that go down to um, uh, South Africa, uh, not every country, but almost every country, uh, the do-gooders, the guys that are going to fix cleft uh, pallets and the guys that are uh, helping kids uh, not be blind, and uh, they're not getting paid. Uh, and those doctors, and we've had some of them here, uh, are poor. They don't have any money. Um, we had a Swiss doctor here a few years ago who had like six or seven clinics. I mean, he was always running around. I, I don't mean this in a bad way, begging for money to run his clinics. I mean, literally begging for money to run his clinics. And he wasn't a very good beggar. I mean, he, his sales skills were shit, not dissimilar to you. And so he had a hard time. And then every once in a while, every four or five years, he'd hit you know some really rich person that fell, not, not fell because it was disingenuous, but, you know, gave him money. What else about, uh, oh, yes, sir, in the back. Uh, to me, it was just more than believing in themselves. And you mentioned it a lot, Mr., is uh, the zealot part. You know, that they have, they're, they're like agents of uh, a higher vision. When you, when you see Mr. Frick, who says, who has a very interesting way of watching the world and considering where people are in terms of social ladder, if I put it mildly. And, uh, and as my um, Chicago colleague said about um, uh, Carnegie's utopia of the industrial world, I mean, it goes beyond believing themselves. It's like they have the beliefs of how the world works. And so they, they just go into it. Carnegie amongst Rockefeller and a lot of those guys but there were 10 times more than those guys that failed. They had a vision too. Uh, one of the uh, funny things is when the two railroads that were built, um, which Carnegie benefited from because he, he was making the rails, from the East Coast and the West Coast, they met somewhere in the middle of the United States. One was using 12 gauge rail and one was using eight gauge rail and they built all across the motherfucking United States and didn't know that until they got within about a mile of each other. This, that reminds me of you. I would have gotten on my fucking donkey or uh, something, and, and I would have gone out there four or five hundred miles or to figure out. And so one, so one gauge is about that high, much higher than the other. And there's a whole books have been written about that. Uh, the um, and so after all that money, all the people that died putting the railing down, blah blah blah, blah uh, and they were mostly Chinese. Um, the, um, and it got fucked up. So, but there were other people that had these visions, but the vision didn't catch on. It's like for those of you that are old enough to remember, uh, uh, the pet rock. You had a, like a rock on the end of a leash, a lead. It sold gazillions. It made the founders, uh, uh, two, three college and gazillionaires. <clears throat> but you don't see pet rocks anymore, do you? Nope. Uh, like the hula hoop. For those of us that are, maybe there's only two of us or three of us old enough to remember the hula hoop. Um, and I couldn't even do a fucking hula hoop to show you how to coordinate it. You know, when I, I could do it on my arm, okay? I couldn't do it on my leg because I couldn't stand on one leg, okay? And I never could do it around my belly. And they convinced housewives of those days that it was a uh, good exercise. And I guess it was. Um, I couldn't do it, but the, uh, there's no more hula hoops, are there? Okay. Um, some of you that are in IT are really like, uh, you're Smith Corona typewriters before the electric IBM came out. You know, there's two or three of you that have IT businesses that aren't state of the art. No, I am the chairman of a hypersecurity company, and the, I know the words, I don't know exactly how it works, but I know um, that... Uh, most IT companies are not state of the art by any imagination, but you're selling to morons that are bigger morons than you. Most shit can get fixed IT on the net. 
And why would you hire somebody for ten or twenty thousand dollars a month when, if you look hard enough, you can have your grand, your your son, look on the net and, and get a podcast? Because people, one, are lazy, two, are stupid, and three, they're uneducated. If you're uneducated in the 21st century with the internet, God Almighty, I can't imagine when you were a caveman how un uneducated you would have been. They'd still be trying to get fire from rocks. So when Carnegie <clears throat> and a few other visionaries that pushed those things through, there was a good, a good amount of serendipity and luck involved. But, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get, you know. The, and you can't hit it for six on, unless you're on the pitch in cricket, and you can't hit a home run unless you're um, in the batter's box swinging away. What else about, yes, sir? Anything else about Mr. Carnegie? Yes, sir. Uh, he pretty much what you described, he pretty much started hard, ruthless, and then went to the philanthropy and then went soft and did all his uh, family. Well, he was trying, he was trying, a, lot, a lot of us try to make up for our sins as we get older. And normally we make up for our sins with a checkbook. You know, the, the billion dollar pledge that came out about 12, 10, 12 years ago that I forget, I'm not sure which one of the billionaires came up with it first. We're going to all give umpteen percent of our, our fortunes. You know how many of, well, there's a lot more billionaires now. There's about 2,500, 3,000. You know how many, in that, those days, there was about 15 or 1,800 billionaires. You know how many of those billionaires made the billion dollar pledge? The guy that started it. But nobody talks about it. <clears throat> I, I am the per, uh, I am, I am the uh, resource of unwanted information. 2,142, we're going to get hit by an asteroid. Nobody gives a shit. Not maybe we're going to get hit. Not a 1% chance we're going to get fucking hit. 100% chance. And no, I guess 2,142, and I might have mentioned this the first day, is far enough out. Well, fuck. Even my kids will be dead by then, you know? So a lot of good deal, good ideas sit on the shelf. Most big companies, there's a theory uh, uh, that uh, in 1963, 4, the American, this, the American Petroleum Institute had a meeting in Las Vegas. And um, the, um, and there was a guy, a PhD guy from uh, uh, Chevron, who was now ExxonMobil, was going to present a paper 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. You know, and... Uh, he left San Francisco, where uh, Chevron's headquarters and now ExxonMobil's headquarters. Um, and 10 o'clock the day before, or the 10 o'clock the next day, he wasn't presenting his paper. And so they thought maybe he got sick or in a crash. And anyway, to make a long story short, he disappeared. They never found him. And what was the paper he was going to present? How you turn, not distilled water, but one molecule different than distilled water. And I'm not a chemist one molecule different than distilled water, you could use as petroleum in a car. Only one molecule different. And uh, in their laboratory, as they say at Siemens, they had figured out how to do this, and the guys disappeared. Now, Gulf Oil, the CFL of Gulf Oil was John Ernest Sewers by CFL. Everybody in the oil business knows that that's sitting in a vault in San Francisco, in what used to be called Chevron, which is now ExxonMobil, that formula. Everybody, the fucking guys, that, the Indian guys that sweep the fucking floor. Now, we, even you, me, has, could, could just barely understand how that would have revolutionized the world in the 60s, let alone now, right? So some things never hit the market. And I know two or three farmer things, and I was involved with one. I fought DuPont for many years, spent a lot of my own money. We came up with a better Kevlar. We had the formula for it, fire resources. Uh, and we had a patent, as they say. I fought 15 years. I got it after two years. Patents are only good, not only, about 17 years. I fought 15 years with my own money. 
Uh, and uh, it was better than Kevlar. It did everything better than Kevlar. And of course, Kevlar they use up in the space and blah, blah, blah. And they, supposedly, Japan spent two, three hundred million dollars keeping me out of the market. Uh, and they went whenever I could find a supplier. Anyway, I know. And so my patent finally expired and nobody gave a shit. There are a lot of things like that that are sitting in a vault someplace. Because, you know, they don't want to change. It's like this Angus County. The farmers are fat and rich here. They, they don't want any government intervention. They don't want any more people. They figured out 30, 40 years ago how to milk the fucking system. And they're milking the system and just getting richer and richer and richer. And that's why there's only four Scottish 500 top companies in this county. Three have been around since Moses. And only one new one. And everything, not everything, but almost everything's the same. From the idea that he had, and he wanted commercial debt because he didn't want to share the equity with partners. That was his reason. Um, and when I figured this out in the early 70s, uh, to this day, nobody teaches it. You're, you're, you're never going to find anybody that understands it unless they've done it. And again, your biggest challenge will be convincing your chairman that you don't need any equity. You heard the pig fucker say, if you listen to him carefully the first day, he said, uh, even though he's not supposed to go back to his own bank, he went back to his own bank and the uh, senior credit officer that he talked to didn't know what seller's finance was. And so the pig fucker said, well, if you don't even know what Settlers Finance was, I'm out of here. Most banks, most being some, some, some uh, measure over 50%, will not know what you're talking about. So if the bankers don't know what you're talking about, and they have done business with all your dream team for 20, 30, 40 years, that's, that's a big challenge. And that's why you've got to be, you have to practice and you have to know what you're talking about, about that portion of the model. You don't have to know about healthcare. You don't have to know about IT. You don't have to know about <clears throat> the individual vertical that you've chosen. But you do have to be convincing enough that there's no money involved. First, no money from him or her. And then second, no money involved in the deal. And the only time that money can, is ever really involved in, is in the United States is when you use the SBA. And that also is in conjunction with a personal guarantee. Okay. This is our super modified action plan. Your desired completion is, in, in the beginning, to find a motivated seller. That's it. Okay. This is after you built your dream team. Yeah, okay. A motivated seller. Um, the, um, how much of your life, how much of your soul, how much of your future, how much of your present, how much of your lifestyle are you willing to give up? Sounds simple in words, doesn't it? That's simple in actions. You heard uh, Simon say uh, yesterday um, when he got more serious and he put his back to the wall and got in a bigger apartment uh, and started spending 150% of what he earned and he sold all his gold and silver, which was his backup plan. Okay? The unfortunate part of it is that most backup plans get used because we give up on our initial plan too early. Um, that was, that was never my, uh, my challenge. The, uh, some people used to say, uh, and I've told you two or three times yesterday and the day before, when Danny gets his head screwed on straight, you know, he's going to tear the world apart. And, and, uh, and, of course, some people, people didn't 
including myself, I didn't really know how smart I was until I got older. Um, because, um, first of all, I, I never heard of IQ until I was in the military. I mean, I, I didn't know what that meant. Uh, and then they give you IQ tests, but the, um, nobody ever, uh, challenged me about how smart I was or how dumb I was because in my neighborhood when I, where I was growing up, you were destined not to accomplish much. That was the thought process. And I told you the only two ways out of where I came from were athletics, and education, not met that, not that many people got the education. And when they got the education, they were teachers or and nothing wrong with that, you know, um, firemen, policemen. So when I started to discover just how smart I was, uh, because I was being compared not to kids from the hood, but from kids outside the hood that can't went to good schools, et cetera. Not, and this is way before uh, I went to school that you got to explain about, um, and then I, I started to challenge myself um, and not use the standards of the kids in my neighborhood, not use the standards of the kids that I went to school with, but using the standards of, you know, when I met John Kennedy when I was 15, 16 years old, who became the uh, president, um, I realized. And so I realized that I was willing to push myself and sacrifice more than they were. Now, arguably, they had a, they being smart people had to sacrifice less on the intellectual side, but more on the emotional side. I didn't understand what self-esteem was. I didn't understand what um, uh, self-worth was. All I knew is that I had a, now I know, a Marvel, super Marvel hero dad, which I didn't understand that. And so I just compared myself to him. And he was a super athlete, which I wasn't. And a lot of people uh, that I know uh, that have been through the seminar, they're psychiatrists, et cetera say that I turned my uh, lack of athletic ability into uh, business acumen uh, because I needed to uh, have done something uh, world-class like my dad had been a world-class athlete. I don't know if that's true. It sounds okay, but I wouldn't bet a nickel on it. So, but that's the theory, okay? Just like there's theories I, I can pontificate about everybody in the room about why you're what you are where you are now but the bottom line is your parents. So I, after all these years, I don't have to finger fuck around to figure it out. Um, how deep you're in this hole of desperation is directly proportionate to uh, how your parents raised you. But I learned about pay price to action early on. Early on. Um, the, uh, so you, either you've already decided or you're gonna decide, hopefully sooner than later, just how much shit you're willing to swallow. And if you if you won't say shit if it's in your mouth, you got a problem. And if you're only willing to take a teaspoon of shit, uh, but if you just open up your mouth like a dump truck and the truck loads up and opens it up and just keeps putting it down your throat till it comes out your butt, you're perfect for this model. You're perfect, okay? Um, and the reason I use you know, such vulgar metaphors is because most people understand shit in mouth. Now, they still wa washed mouths out with soap when I was a kid. And uh, I can still, uh, my taste buds, I can still kinda remember that. My grandmother washed my mouth out more than my mother did. My dad never washed my mouth out, he just whacked me. So, uh, the uh, Eating soap is easier than getting whacked. I can attest to that. I could probably write a book about that. So what pay price to action are you willing to do? You know, and we've heard, uh, actually Simon's the only one that actually talked about the sacrifices. Although uh, Andres Milner alludes to the sacrifices. Uh, and he said that I, I, I'm here because uh, my, my, wife, my wife and my uh, family, he means his daughter, uh, made a lot of sacrifices. So you either know it's gonna be an easy sell to your family or overwhelmingly hard sell to your family vis-a-vis -vis any changes you might make. So that's what you have to, you know, again, you don't have to do anything. If you choose to, you'll have to, you will deal with that. And some of the kids have dealt with it extremely well and some of the kids deal with it really poorly. 
because most people understand the permutations of not dealing with your family. Most people understand the permutations of not dealing with uh, your wife in the same way. But I'm here to tell you, and I would be disingenuous, it's worse than you think. As bad as you think it might be, it's worse. It, it just is. They, um, so you'll deal with that, or you won't. That's your choice. But, and part of your measurement tools is the weekly reports you're going to get. And by periodically, I measured daily, at the end of each day. It's a weekly report, but you will not be able to keep all the information in your head. You, you can take good enough notes <laughs> uh, to uh, fairly reflect, reflect uh, your successes and your failures. Uh, now, if you just cut out to everything, that's easy. At the end of the week, I just, you draw a line to the thing, I cut it out to everything. You didn't do any of this stuff, okay? Um, one of the questions is, what did you do to scare yourself today? I.e., how did you step out of your comfort zone? Now, you can't go bungee jump every day, uh, and you can't go jump in front of a, a speeding Corvette like Jason did in the film. If, uh, maybe you could do that every day, uh, but there, uh, you know, the, uh, but something. For some of you, it'll be a cold call in every day. Uh, and you've heard Simon amongst others, say that they, they stared at the phone for an hour. Because, and, um, and I never really got used to cold calling, although I was good at it. I never got used to it where it was, you know, uh, like, uh, I like chocolate ice cream. You know, I, I never got used to it, but I was able to force myself. And in the beginning, remember, uh, uh, Jim Ryan, the great miler who never won a gold medal at the Olympics, told me many years ago, uh, motivation gets you started, Danny. Uh, good habits keep you going. Right now, most of you have piss poor habits. Not everybody. You're going to hear a guy, to Roberto, today, uh, who had good habits. Uh, he was one of the few that in the last several years that had extraordinary habits. Most of the habits you have are bad. See, we don't equate habits... Um, now, smoking is an obvious bad habit. And with all the advertising to what cigarettes in four or five years smoking, I don't give a shit, you know, with all the advertising, with all the data that's come out, people still smoke. I don't really care, you know. But that's part of the self sabotaging death wish that I keep telling you. The, uh, back in the day, almost everybody smoked. When I went to Germany in 1967, first of all, uh, they, they dressed up and you know, not like the kids dress today and uh, almost everybody smoked. And, um, the, uh, of course when smoking first started, women, uh, didn't smoke because it wasn't considered ladylike. Well, that was probably a good idea. Well, it's not manly like either, but, but people still smoke. Uh, so what sacrifices, uh, are you willing to make? Uh, and then you got to measure them. I measure daily. Because I don't, just like I weigh myself daily, even though you're not supposed to weigh yourself daily. I weigh myself daily. I don't want to find out after a week. And everybody here will gain three to five pounds during the week, if you're eating the meals. I realize some of you aren't eating all the meals, but three to five pounds. Because that's the difference. And we, we've done the caloric study and all that shit. Three to five pounds and, uh, is what the average person gains here. Even the skinny ones. Um, now, what does that mean? Not that we're, this is not a dietitian thing. Does that mean all the food here is high caloric? Yes. Does that mean you're not getting enough exercise here? Yes. I know a couple of you got get up and you know do some exercise. Uh, does that mean that uh, you know um, how does the diet here compare to your own personal diet? Well, not many of us, myself included have good dietary habits. Some that come here have good dietary habits, okay? So how did you develop good dietary habits? Trial and error, maybe you read a book, maybe you've got uh, a significant other 
that um, is a uh, dietary conscience, conscious, but I recommend that you measure daily, daily. Uh, and then you've only got one day, if you really fuck up, to get back on the program. If you only do it weekly, then you've got a week to make up that you fucked up. Uh, and um, last but not least is um, what they don't teach you is how to modify your plans uh, when you're a great track athlete, which I wasn't, but I trained with some great track athletes. Uh, the guys that are t timing you or whatever they're doing know what you did yesterday, what you did the day before, what you did the day before that. And if, you know, uh, and everybody has a bad day, but, uh, other than the, uh, the bad day, you know, you're going to run more. You're going to do this more. You're going to do this more. And Houston Bolt, which most of you have heard of, who was a, uh, probably still is a world-class athlete, even though he doesn't really compete anymore. His, his uh, roommate and his training partner is a man he's been to the seminar a couple of times. And, uh, but never, in other words, he's not a 9-7 or a 9-8 guy. He's a 9-9 or a 10 or a 10-1, which you don't win any fucking medals with that. Uh, and he said that um, Houston for uh, nine years, 11 months, and one week trained the exact same way when he was at the top, when he was the 100 and 200 champion in the world games, the blah, blah, blah. And then towards the end, when he had decided to retire, he uh, decided to, legend has it, that he would change his, uh, he didn't want to work as hard the last few weeks. Well, his last competition, he fin finished third in the world in the 100. He had never been third in his life. And so the guy, my guy, and he said, and uh, he used to work out, and we used to work out with him until he vomited, until he threw up, until he spent every last ounce that's within him. So he had nine years, 11 months, and one week of throwing up every fucking day. He spent. There is nothing left in him. And he decides to change his regimen, and he finished third. Well, you don't have those kind of habits. Um, you don't have a reserve built up. Not a reserve in athletic terms, but a reserve in confidence, a reserve in self-esteem, and a reserve in self-worth. It's like I say, I can't remember the last time I, I failed at something, which is true. Because I have so many successes. I have a bank, a storage facility, of self-esteem, call it, okay? Uh, and whereas most people, or actually nobody that's come through the seminar has had that, even remotely close. But I work at it every day. I brush my teeth the same way every day. I take a shower the same way. I take a shower like I used to see my dad take a shower. When I'm, I do, when I, an hour ago, when I turn off the water, I always, before I step out of the shower, I always wipe the excess water off me, just like my dad did. Now, how much water am I actually taking off? Not too much, right? But I used to see my dad as a little boy, and so Pavlov's dog, you don't do what they tell you, they do what you see them do. And my habits are the same, taking my vitamins, the first ones in the morning, during the day, although this is my limited uh, addition of vitamins, because otherwise I'd have a, a bowl like this, like uh, M&M's, I take so many pills a day. Uh, and I do everything the same. I know when to make calls. Yesterday when I had that Zoom call with uh, lawyers and accountants and some board members, that's very unusual that I do it during, because I just don't do it because I'm devoted to you during the seminar. But we planned around to have that call it was supposed to be an hour, around an hour webinar that you had. Uh, and of course, I'm here in case anything goes wrong. A couple of people on the Zoom call did say, I hear your voice. Do we have a double uh, uh, echo? Because they could hear me in here. No, no, it's not an echo. And I said, I'm speaking via uh, a taped webinar in the next room. Most of you don't have those habits. But if what you're doing isn't working, you've got to modify it. Most of you have worked in an organization, they say, oh, you join us, thank you very much, Clay. 
uh, it's going to take you a while to get your feet on the ground and understand what you're doing. So uh, we'll, we'll meet again in three months. Uh, or we'll have a review in six months. That's not what the high-performance person does. You've got minutes or hours to get your feet on the ground. Because if you're not performing in a high-performance world, then your history, your history. But this, if you keep this on a card, on your uh, screensaver, I think it's called, um, and measure yourself in conjunction with the goals that you wrote and affirmations last night, and your goals and affirmations will change. Now, rarely does the individual, the you that is uh, doing affirmations, rarely will you not see improvement some people see improvement in days. Most see improvement, meaning change, in weeks. Something's not right if you're not seeing improvement in days or weeks. Either your subconscious, either your goal is immoral, unethical, illegal, or a combination of all three, and your subconscious is fighting it, you'll see results. We've had people that have had, unfortunately, such uh, diabolically ugly goals, and so, um, but they work. They work. And part of the, you know, the, the goal system. Now, about a third, if all of you leave tomorrow and go out 100, 120 hours, you know, in my dreams, 100, 120 hours a week, a third of you are gonna get sick. Uh, because your immune system can't take it. You're going to come down with colds, the flu. Okay. Forget corona. Okay. A third of you are going to be permanently tired. If you don't get tired, even the young kids, if you're going to get permanently tired. Uh, and a third of you um, will give up. Not physically, but give up mentally. I like to hear when I used to get the weekly reports, you know, after nine days, I, I couldn't keep my head up. Um, it also means that you're not exercising. It also not, means you're not eating properly. This methodology needs fuel, physical fuel. The mental fuel is immersing yourself in the material. But the physical fuel, I mean, and, and some of you, even though you're not fat, you're out of shape. Uh, and for those of you that are fat, you already know you're out of shape. So I don't have, I don't have to tell you that. Um, the, um, but pushing yourself 24-7, 365 is a motherfucker. It's hard. Now, I still work 50, 60 hours a week, but I don't consider it work. So at my age, I'm an anomaly. 50, 60 hours is, is an anomaly. 50, 60 hours is more than most of you in this room have ever worked in your lives. And I'm going to be 77 in a couple of weeks. But you'll learn to push yourself. And what will keep you going is as the results, as Simon sees the results um, that he's produced in a couple of years. And the great thing about the QLA model is you see the results materially. You see the results, you realize. And then when you start to buy cars and shit and clothes, and uh, I'm not here to tell you to take a bit, uh, better vacations, holidays like Andreas, but he's been doing it three years, so he went on a holiday. You know, uh, Elon Musk said, I don't know, six, seven years ago, uh, he didn't believe in vacations because the last time he took a vacation, he almost died. He went to Peru or legitimately down South America someplace. Um, the, um, Bill Gates now says the, the most, one of the most important things about founding the company is having sales skills. This is after 45 years he says this. And of course, we read in Inc. Magazine a couple of days ago um, about uh, the habits of high performance people. All these things are coming out, yet um, there's still nobody that I'm aware of uh, that teaches them like us. Um, Okay, you, YouTube, thank you.